Cooper and Business there, and, and my screen's been shared. Um, so I guess to introduce myself, guys, my name is Michael McFadden. I'm the, the supervisor of the herpetofauna department at Taronga Zoo in Sydney, uh, where I've been for the last some time now, close to 18 years. Um, we work with a range of reptile and amphibian species collection animals, but we're also, um, we're also, actually, there's people jumping into the waiting room. Um, we work a range of reptile and amphibian species, but these days we do a lot more work with conservation program animals, uh, including the, the, the threatened frogs that I'm going to talk about today, uh, and a range of also uh, critically endangered and um, extinct in the wild uh, reptiles. Um, lucky enough at Taronga Zoo that we've got a really a really great team of, of keepers, uh, all professional and experienced, which really assist our work uh, in this process. Today, I'm going to be talking about the ex situ amphibian conservation. So the different programs that we're working with at Taronga, um, and there's, there's four particular um, programs I'll talk about today. And regarding regarding those, I don't know if you can hear me, Lynn. I'm admitting people to the waiting room. Should I keep doing that or should I? Uh, that's up to you. If it's not too distracting, I um, because yeah. you're host, I'm not able to. So um, um, that's something that we will bear in mind for next time. But, uh, but sorry about that. If you're happy to, Mike, uh, then yeah, do let them in. Um, and I'm all good. Sure I, I, I can so. selectively screen who comes in. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but otherwise, hearing you uh, loud and clear looks great. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so in terms of ex situ amphibian conservation, for, for those unfamiliar with the term ex situ, it's conservation that happens outside of the field. So conservation that's occurring uh, outside of the direct habitat. So for example, at a zoo or somewhere else um, and not directly in the wild. Uh, these days, ex situ conservation is happening more and more because a lot of the species we're working with are either so critically endangered or extinct in the wild that in the short term, they'll go extinct unless we're able to set up insurance colonies to, to prevent the extinction in the short term. So it's really a, a conservation measure, something I'd refer to as a, a short term measure, even though it can last uh, decades, but a short term measure to try to um, buy this species some time while we can either address the threats in the wild uh, or bolster the animal so they can, they've got a, a significant enough population that they can withstand the, uh, the threats facing the species. So in terms of ex situ amphibian conservation in recent years, the last maybe decade or two decades, it's really expanded in Australia. Uh, if you go back, I guess, two decades ago uh, to around the year 2000, there was one or two amphibian conservation programs in Australian zoos in general, uh, and they're on a much smaller scale. Whereas since around the mid 2000s, uh, that's, that really started expanding and really has so over the last decade. Um, and most of the amphibian conservation in Australian zoos has done more on a regional scale. I'll just show it. Of images of that, I guess. Um, so you'll see here, like most of the species in southeast, so within the green circle there, that southeast region, uh, it's focused on by a range of southeast Australian zoos or wildlife parks. I'll talk about our programs today, but Melbourne Zoo uh, work on a, uh, they got an awesome team down there working on amphibian conservation and they work on a range of species, including uh, the crabby frogs, which I'll talk about today, but also species like the bauble frog one of your critically endangered endemics down in Victoria, and they're doing an amazing job with that. Uh, Hillsville Sanctuary, similarly, working with things like the spotted tree frog and, and the crabby frogs. Tibbin Villa Nature Reserve has done an amazing job with the northern crabby frog populations in the ACT uh, over the last two decades close to, and Amphibian Research Centre um, initiated the program of crabby frogs, and, and these days does some great work with spotted tree frogs. Uh, in southwestern Australia, there's two species, the Geocrinia uh, and Perth Zoo are doing an amazing job with those two species, um, the, the orange-bellied frog and the white-bellied frog, uh, head-starting eggs collected from the wild and, and reintroducing them to the wild and actually, actually been successful in starting up new populations, which, is, which has been amazing. In Queensland, Corumban Sanctuary have doing, been doing an amazing job in recent years. Um, for those not familiar with the genus Claudaculus, it's the, the tinker frogs and the day frogs. Unfortunately, within that genus, there's six species, uh, three or four to have been extinct in, in Australia now, two are critically endangered and one's near threatened. So Grumman initiated the program uh, some time ago now with the, the near threatened species, Tordaculus liamai, um, the younger tinker frog. And it took them a few years and they established the breeding protocols and have done amazingly with it since then. Uh, so now they can move on to the, the Crimban tops tinker uh, frog, which is um, critically endangered and um, is a species I'll work to next. And then down in Tassie, uh, Tasmanian tree frog, Bonnerong Wildlife Park has started working with that species. So 
Effectively, frog conservation in Australia in zoos and wildlife parks is done on, a, on somewhat a regional scale. So today there's, there's four species I'm going to talk a little bit about. They're all four species that we work with closely at Taronga uh, with a number of partners. i uh, just give you a little bit of an overview of those species, the fresh face, and what's exactly happening in the field at the moment with some of those, with some of those species. So this one doesn't really need too much in the way of introduction. This little guy here is a southern corroboree frog. Uh, this species is, is an iconic species. It's really well known. Uh, you can see bright, bright coloration there. Uh, they kind of need no introduction. They're bright yellow and black, which signifies that these guys are quite, um, are, are quite toxic. Uh, they, they are a poisonous frog, so they don't have much in the way of natural predators in the wild. Um, and for this species, which hasn't got much in the way of predation, um, and is fully found, I don't know if you can see my, um, my little mouse cursor there, but the, the darker area at the bottom of that distribution map is the southern Crowley frog. So their habitat is fully within Kosciuszko National Park. They're restricted to that high altitude area, so they're only above uh, 1,300 metres in elevation, so they're quite a cool climate species. Uh, throughout the winter, these guys are, are totally underneath a, a layer of snow, so they're really adapted to that cold climate. Uh, but they're fully within the National Park, and they're... Um, they don't have much in the way of predators, so introduced predators aren't a really a factor for these guys. So they're not your typical endangered species. However, their population doesn't signify that. These, these guys are unfortunately are in quite a bad state in the wild. Um, back, if you go back prior to the mid-1980s, this frog would have numbered in the hundreds of thousands up in Kosciuszko. Uh, they lived throughout the Stegman bog systems um, in the National Park, and uh, they'd come down and breed around the pools in those Stegman bog systems. Um, in some sites by the many hundreds uh, and there would have been hundreds of thousands if not millions of these frogs throughout that throughout that habitat. Unfortunately in the mid 80s this species had a massive population crash uh, and then since then since the 90s um, their numbers have been kind of petering off uh, to, to where they exist today where unfortunately that this map only goes to 2016 I've updated this one but but um, their numbers in the wild now at non-reintroduction sites are unfortunately either non-existent or in such low numbers they're not detectable whereas at our reintroduction sites the, the, uh, these guys are still persisting and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So unfortunately this species um, without ex situ intervention uh, is a species that would certainly join the extinction list with the, the gastric brooding frogs and those others that have disappeared since the since the 80s. This little guy here is one of the reasons for the decline of the corroboree frog. Uh, this one here is called the common eastern frog Sure, most of our um, most of the people out there today listening would be familiar with this species. Um, they're a common frog throughout southeastern Australia, and they're a cool little frog. Quite a variety of patterns and colours on these guys. Um, and although they're they're not the enemy, they're a nice little native in their own right. This species, unfortunately, up in those high altitude areas, carries high kidney loads. So about maybe over ninety percent of these little buggers carry chytrid fungus on their skin, but it doesn't affect them, which is great for the common eastern froglet. But it means for the corroboree frog, there's another species called a reservoir host, a uh, species that carries a disease but isn't affected by it, but shedding it throughout the ecosystem. And these little frogs live in the same bogs as the, the southern corroboree frog. So they're sympatric, they live alongside each other. Which means, unfortunately, for the corroboree frog, um, chytra fungus, which is what is wiping out the corroboree frog, isn't going to disappear in the wild. And it's not going to disappear or decline to such a low number uh, around these sites that, that it's going to burn itself out because it's always got a a reservoir host species that's carrying it. So the common eastern frog in large numbers is, is a bit of a problem to some species like the northern crabby frog and the southern crabby frog. Um, so for those, I think most people here would be familiar with chytrid fungus. Chytrid fungus is a, a disease that's uh, arrived in Australia uh, back in the, in, in the 1970s. Uh, it's thought now from genomic studies that originated on, on the Korean peninsula and it spread all around the world. It got to Australia in the uh, in the 70s, and it, it spread from kind of southeast Queensland, northeast New South Wales, up and down the coast. Uh, unfortunately, it took out a few of our species, including the, the amazing gastric brooding frogs um, and, and a few others. And at the same time, across in Central America, it was taking out many, many more species than what occurred here in Australia. So unfortunately, it's quite a, a lethal disease that, that um, uh, impacts the frogs. Some frog species, like the common eastern froglet, it doesn't impact greatly or, or at all. Uh, other species, like the corroboree frog, are totally susceptible to this fungus. And then you've got a range of other species in between where um, they can be in, uh, infected by the fungus and it may not impact them, it just hangs around, but you get a bit of a cold spell or a bit of stress and, uh, and the frogs can start suffering or dying off from it. Or sometimes frogs die at different times of the year from the fungus when it gets a bit cooler and the fungus prevails. 
So for the Southern Crabby Frog, there is um, for the Southern Crabby Frog, there's a um, a captive breeding program in place, a, a zoo breeding program set up at a number of institutions. Uh, eggs for this species, this species wasn't collected as frogs, uh, they were only collected as eggs, and eggs were collected over a seven year period to initiate the insurance population for the species. Um, typically, on, we, we go out to nest and from each nest, only collect a, a very small number of eggs. So that way we, we didn't impact on the, the population that was out there, but we were able to take a, I guess, a bit of a genetic variety to establish the insurance colony. The insurance colony for this species isn't just at Taronga Zoo, it's at a range of zoos. Uh, predominantly at Taronga and Melbourne Zoo and Hillsville Sanctuary have an MAI system in place for this species and the Amphibian Research Centre. And the MAI system that I just referred to, that's actually the genetic management pro um, program for this species. Uh, all the threatened amphibians and reptiles we work with, uh, they're closely genetically managed to make sure we ensure the genetic diversities of these species for as long as we can. So an MAI system is kind of like a round robin system where you have males and females and then after the next generation, we'd move the males to the offspring of the uh, of the, the next breeding tank along. And we can do that and shuffle them around through generations. And for crawberry frogs, I think we worked out, we can get at least 30 years before we have any level of inbreeding um, by, by using these genetic management systems. And we have those set up in place at Taronga, at Melbourne Zoo and at Hillsville Sanctuary to be able to maintain the genetic diversity of the species long-term. Uh, and the other good thing about sharing this over a number of zoos uh, is that um, you have different people working on the species, trialing different techniques to try to improve the husbandry techniques, improve the rearing techniques. And also there's a bit of bed hedging in place. It means that uh, if something goes wrong at one of our facilities, uh, God forbid, but if a, a fire starts or a disease gets in or anything like that happens, it means the insurance colony is really insurance. It's over a number of institutions. Uh, and each population is held in quarantine climate controlled facilities. So you can see there in the, in the top photo, uh, effectively it's a shipping container it's been converted to a frog facility. Um, and this type of design was started down at the Amphibian Research Centre uh, down in Victoria. And it's utilised around the world now. Uh, and the, the benefit of this is that the, the facility is insulated, it's separate from the main collection. Uh, uh, for example, the, the zoo's, I guess, um, collection animals of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, and it's also, the, the insulation is perfect for this species because throughout the winter period, this facility will chill down to four or five degrees Celsius. We give these guys a, a really nice winter cooling period uh, to try to mimic what's happening in the wild. We don't cool them for as long as they experience in the wild because we want to make sure we get enough condition on the animals that they're able to breed the following year. But we give them a nice cooling period where they all bunker down. They start, crawberry frogs tend to bunker down from about 10 degrees Celsius. They, they bury down under the moss and they don't come up again. They don't feed. Um, and then when we warm them up again, they, they start appearing again. And in the bottom photo there, you can see one of our breeding tanks. Um, so it's a sphagnum moss tank uh, that's been set up for, for these guys. And these are the uh, tanks that these little frogs get into in breeding. I'm gonna chuck this photo in to introduce someone in the photo. Um, uh, the fellow you can see on the right there is Dr. David Hunter. So this is while we're collecting eggs to start the insurance population. So uh, some time ago now, uh, well over a decade ago, um, that's Dr. David Hunter. And, Dave Hunter uh, coordinates this program. He, he's done some absolutely amazing things for Australian frogs. In fact, there's a few species like the Southern Crabby Frog and even the Yellow Spotted Bell Frog, which I'll talk about today, uh, Spotted Tree Frogs in, in New South Wales. There's a range of species that probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Dave. And he coordinates the recovery team for both the Southern and Northern Crabby Frog and, and does a, a, an amazing job at it. So here in this photo, um, you can see just at the back of one of these facilities, just to explain a little bit of the husbandry side of things. I'll talk more about the conservation side of things, but husbandry wise, we have a refrigeration unit at the back that cools the facility. Uh, if you see the silver box there, um, just above it, there's a little white box that sits above there. That's a light sensitive switch. So all of our facilities at the zoo have a light sensitive switch. And what that does is it turns the lights on in the facility as soon as it becomes light of a morning. So it uh, mimics the photo period of, of, of I guess, Sydney. So when it becomes light of the morning, all the lights turn on. When it becomes dark of an evening, all the lights turn off. So it mimics that photo period. And for some species like the crabby frogs, uh, photo period is really important. Uh, this is a species that breeds the same couple of weeks of the year, every year in the wild, uh, regardless of temperature and rainfall. Um, if it's a poor year, drought or so forth, they may breed less, there may be less of them, but, but it's the same calling period that they, they have indicating uh, photo period is probably a big factor in that. Um, there's a reverse osmosis unit. So Water for the crawberry frogs is actually, it goes through an RO filter, which really purifies the water. 
Uh, we wouldn't do that for all species. Uh, the other species I'll talk about today, um, the very long frog and the, the, the bell frogs, we wouldn't use RO water alone because uh, RO water is so pure, it would actually um, be neg a negative impact on those species. It, it really do some damage to their kidneys. But for crawberry frogs, we've done water testing up in Kosciuszko and the water is really soft. The pH is between five and a half and six and a half. So it's quite, it's quite soft um, water. Uh, so we try to mimic that by using the RO unit and adding a little bit of trace elements back into the water for the tadpoles, um, but, but utilizing quite soft water. And then alternate, also just inside that little snapshot within the screen, is the climate control system that controls the climate within the facility. So through this, we can set temperatures at different times of the day. So we can have a, a peak in the daytime uh, going down in the afternoon in the low of the nighttime. But there's also backup temperatures, um, backup, I guess, thermostats and alarms in this computer system. So if the temperature gets above a certain, a certain level, it cuts off all power to the lights. So the refrigeration struggles for whatever reason, the power to the lights gets cut off, cut off which prevents the, the, the facility from heating up. Uh, we also have remote sensors, so if something goes off, if the temperature hits a certain high or low point in the facility, uh, we get alerts, we get emails and text messages just to let us know something's going wrong. With all of these facilities, we want to make sure if anything goes wrong whatsoever, we're alerted straight away because um, these are some of Australia's most endangered animals in these facilities. So the breeding program at the zoos is actually going really well. Uh, you can see a little male there with a, with a, with a little clutch of eggs uh, that, that, that he's on top of. Um, the breeding program is going really well and you can see since like 2009, 10, 11, uh, the, the number of fertile eggs produced each year is going up and up and up. And you can see there, I haven't put in 2020, but 2019, you can see there it's about 3,000 eggs and that's just the fertile eggs. And these guys only lay 30 to 35 odd eggs in the clutch. Um, so, and, and this is just a fertile egg. So really kind of at the zoos now, we're producing kind of 5,000 plus eggs a year. So that's hundreds of clutches uh, from these little guys. Um, between between each of the zoos that are working on this, um, loads of eggs are produced each year, and it's always around that uh, February March type period. Uh, January they start the calling. February March we start getting the eggs. Uh, and fortunately, by producing so many eggs in the breeding program, it's allowed us to do a, a range of things now. It's allowed us to try, trial a, a range of reintroductions, uh, which I'll show a photo of in just a moment. Um, but it's also allowed us to use um, our offspring for a range of research activities, including. Um, Hopefully, in, in, in the future, working with the Lee Skerritt and Lee Berger, we've, we've been working on disease immunity since way back in 2010 with alpine tree frogs and so forth. Um, it's allowed us to do um, assisted reproduction trials, uh, to be able to determine sperm and eggs from certain frogs for, that'll assist with future uh, conservation research in the future. So there's a range of things that producing uh, that amount of offspring has, has enabled us to do to have a much greater understanding of the species and how we're going to conserve it into the future. That's just a photo for Q factor there. That's one of the little guys kind of just metamorphosing. So you can see they get their pattern as soon as they sprout those front legs or just before you see the pattern developing on their back. Uh, as a tadpole, they're quite dark, but then as, they, as they're about to sprout out of the legs, they develop that, um, uh, that distinct patterning uh, until their little tail absorbs. And you can see there when they metamorphose, um, they're tiny little guys. So when these guys first metamorphose, they're only about 0.2 of a gram. So they're a very small little frog. So you can imagine feeding these little frogs, they, they, they eat the tiniest little crickets when they first metamorphose. So they'll eat things like little springtails, they'll eat tiny little crickets that have only just hatched, if not only a day or two old. Um, uh, within the zoos, we feed them a range of things, including uh, small slaters, wood lice, and uh, a bit of variety in their diet. But, but um, And these guys grow, I guess, relatively quickly. Uh, within a year or so, they're, they're well and truly over a gram, but that's about the size they metamorphose at. So they're quite small when, they're, um, when they first metamorphose. So in terms of some of the translocations we've been working with, um, since, since 2007, uh, we've been working with um, doing egg reintroductions to, to a number of sites in Kosciuszko. Um, so you can see here, these little artificial pools set up. These are at, currently at three different sites. They were at four different sites in, in, in Kosciuszko National Park. And the purpose of these is to, to place eggs in the tubs so that way they can go through their process of being a tadpole for metamorphosis in an environment free of chytra fungus. Um, and also free of the impacts of drought seasons and so forth as well. They've always got permanent water. Uh, Dr. Dave Hunter uh, uh, rigged all these up and set all these uh, tubs up in, in Cozzy and, and they've got a permanent flow of water through them. Um, and so far through releasing eggs into these tubs, 
I'd have to check the current numbers, but at least about 70% of them get through to metamorphosis. So that's a, that's a fairly high rate of survival um, within these types, certainly more than what would be in natural nests in the wild. And the, 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 the aim of this translocation is to try to keep these populations persisting in the wild. By reintroducing eggs into these tubs, um, getting them the metamorphosed, the frogs jump out, then they enter the bog, and then they're off on their own for the next three or four years. Um, this species doesn't actually become sexually mature until about four years of age. So it's quite a while. Sometimes the female is up until five years of age. Uh, sometimes males can call a little bit earlier at three years of age, but, but uh, it's a slow process because they're found up in that cool climate area where they have a, I guess, a more prolonged lifespan. Uh, in the wild, these guys live for maybe nine years or so. Uh, in the zoos, they can live for up to 20 years. So it's a lot longer. Uh, in fact, most of our, most of our frogs these days are, our founders are well over a decade and still really high survival year to year in those guys. And I suspect I'll breed for another, maybe close to a decade yet. Uh, so the aim of this translocation is to keep the population persistent in that wild environment. By keeping them ticking over and breeding and coming back uh, in this wild environment, hopefully over time, these guys will start to hopefully naturally select for resistance to, to chytra fungus if they're, if they're surviving with it. Some of our other translocations are, are, are a little bit different. And I'll, I'll show you. Some of the other things uh, Dave did here with National Parks and Wildlife Services to create big disease-free enclosures down in Kosciuszko National Park. So there's two of them, two big disease-free enclosures. And in there, he's created a whole range of um, natural pools. You can see, actually, the person you can see in that photo there uh, is Dr. Ben Scheel. Uh, and Ben's an amazing scientist. He's at the Australian National University. He's done a lot of amazing work on chytrid fungus. And I guess he's one of the, the world leaders in, in this area at the moment. And fortunately for us, uh, he's very involved in the Crabby Frog recovery team and the recovery program. So here in this enclosure, this was when it was first being set up. Uh, so it hadn't been established just yet, but it's a large enclosure in a remote part of Cozy. And the aim of this is to be able to introduce, so frogs were first introduced into here from, um, from into this enclosure anyway, from the amphibian research center. And then eggs from the zoos have been introduced into there since 2012, I believe. Um, and the population's ticking over okay. And, and each year, uh, Dave's able to harvest a number of eggs out of these enclosures uh, for translocation to, to other sites uh, and for other purposes. Uh, this is the enclosure uh, only about a year or so ago. So it's become a lot more established now within the enclosure. Uh, ant colonies have established food colonies for the, for, the, for the frogs in there. And they're able to breed in these enclosures uh, in a disease-free environment. Uh, frogs don't get into there. So we're able to be able to harvest eggs in a chytrid-free environment, still in Kosciuszko National Park. So effectively, it's like a it's like an additional, I guess, captive breeding colony, um, but it's in a wild environment. It gets natural UV. It has natural uh, food, natural climate conditions. So the frogs are quite naturalised in these enclosures. In recent years, this has expanded more so um, to become um, a lot more disease-free enclosures down in Cozy. So we've uh, put enclosures at additional three sites uh, within Kosciuszko National Park, and these are smaller. Uh, ring enclosures and within these enclosures they're only made out of color bond but there's a pipe that runs along the inside of the enclosure which prevents the frogs from getting out and also prevents crinia the species that lives sympatrically down there from being able to climb up and get into the enclosures so we've established these enclosures throughout Kosciuszko National Park they're built by National Parks and Wildlife Service um, and we've been reintroducing or introducing frogs into these enclosures for a number of years now uh, trialing different things so trialing different techniques within the enclosures uh, we've been releasing metamorph frogs and adult frogs to see what the survival rate is between these. And one of the, one of the tools that these may surface for us, um, supply for us is by introducing, if we want to release 300 uh, southern crawberry frogs, adults a year, currently we wouldn't be able to do that. That would take a whole kind of 20 foot, 40 foot um, frog facility just alone to rear a cohort of those frogs for three years prior to release. If we can do it in a wild environment, with natural sunlight, natural food, uh, in these, it's a much more cost-effective uh, and hopefully much more natural way to rear these frogs to maturity to be able to utilize them for, for further reintroduction efforts. So that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And you can see there on the left, uh, some of the little frogs from one of the censuses. Uh, we go out and census these enclosures uh, four times throughout the, the summer period to, to work out survival rates and, and how they're going. So this is just a photo of uh, some of the little frogs at one of the sites. Um, and one of the things I thought I would show today, because it's something that's, I guess, quite topical because it's happened in recent years. Uh, the little photo you see there, the next photo is the exact same site, but one year after, almost one year to the date after this photo was taken. 
So unfortunately, some of our sites did get hit by the bushfires. Uh, and the bushfires raged through a good chunk of Kosciuszko. I'll speak about that with the next species too. But, but raged through a good chunk of Kosciuszko. And unfortunately, the fires that moved down to this area moved so quickly, they, they covered many, many tens of kilometres in a day and, and got down there before, without any level of warning. Uh, so unfortunately, fires did burn through enclosures at a couple of sites, not all the sites, some of those large disease-free enclosures. Uh, one of them wasn't impacted, another one being built wasn't impacted, but one was, and some of our ring enclosures were. Um, and you can see some of the, I guess, some of the carnage from the bushfires this season. Um, some of the water tanks are no longer recognisable as water tanks, some partly melted, uh, and the enclosures uh, to a large degree got burnt. Uh, however, fortunately, one of the things that occurred when Dave Hunter designed these enclosures, he did it in such a way that some of them had deep retreats within the enclosures. And fortunately, a number of the Kerberi frogs had bunkered down and, and I don't know how they survived such level of heat, but with, with bushfires, it's amazing what species can survive and, and how they do it. There was a number of frogs that had bunkered right down, um, bunkered right down deeper into the deep retreats. And when, we, when it was safe to do so, as soon as we'll give them the green light to go in there after the fires, we did check on all the frogs and do a census and about 30% of them survived or more, 35% of them survived the bushfire, uh, which, which was actually quite promising. I, I kind of expected a lot lower. Uh, this season, um, I know Dave's been out there with national parks rebuilding the enclosures and, and additionally this time putting in extra fire control measures. He had sprinkler systems. Unfortunately, Dave went out there because of the hot weather and the dry weather and had the sprinkler system going in the enclosure for days before the bushfire hit anyway, uh, before that bushfire had even started. Um, which was quite fortunate for these frogs. Um, but uh, as a result of the revamp that's currently going on, hopefully we'll have satellite controlled kind of sprinkler systems, metal pipes and metal tanks that'll, that'll keep these guys nice and wet into the future. So that's it about the southern crabby frog. Um, the northern crabby frogs are very similar species. These guys on that map on the right, once again, I can't tell if you can see my little mouse there, but the, the two darker areas of distribution map on, on, the, on the, the top up there, um, up, up there is the northern crabby frog, and there's three different ESUs or evolutionary significant units for the, the northern crabby frog. There's the fiery range ESU, which is the, the, the big part in the west on the left hand side there, and there's the two Brindabella ESUs, the northern Brindabella and the southern Brindabella, which is in the ACT, which is along that thin line on the, on the right there. And as you can see from the photo there, northern crabby frogs are pretty similar to southerns. Um, they, they tend to have a little bit more dark marking on their back than the southerns, uh, it's a bit more broad on the southerns, and these guys, the, the the yellow is a little bit more lime green in colour as well, in, in, not in all populations, but in a number of the populations of the species. As an example over there. So at Taronga, we, we've been working with the, the northern Brindabella ESU for about 10 years now. Um, that population was in a little bit of strife, uh, so, so we became involved in this species in 2010 uh, from the northern Brindabellas. The southern Brindabella ESU, the, the, the one in the ACT, is the focus of the work at Tibbinbilla Nature Reserve and Hillsville Sanctuary. Uh, so at Taronga, we had the Northern Brindabella ESU. And that ESU in 2012, uh, only three colony males were detected. So it got down to pretty low numbers during that period. Um, we started doing reintroductions there in, in 2010, 2011. Uh, so this program, uh, once again, is working with Dave Hunter uh, and working with National Parks and Wildlife Service and also working with Ben Shield. Currently at Taronga, we have close to 300 or so frogs from the Northern Brindabella ESU that we've been breeding for release. We've been doing reintroductions since 2010. Let me check if my next slide there. Um, the reintroductions for this species haven't been in the enclosures. Here we've been releasing them at the wild sites. Um, and we've, we've tried a few different techniques. So in terms of breeding and releasing these animals, we've been releasing eggs for a number of years, but we've also done releases of one-year-old frogs, uh, of metamorph frogs, and also of mature five-year-old frogs. And one of the reasons for that, with all of our reintroductions that we do, or all of our translocations, they're all done in a scientific way, in, in an experimental format. They're all trial releases. They're done in an experimental way that, that will allow us to benefit from and be able to change the technique that we use each year. So uh, everything we learn from each year that we do it, we're able to, I guess, fine tune the technique. Our end aim is to be able to, to use the translocation um, protocol that works best for the species to establish populations. So the more we twist and, and tweak that um, um, to benefit the survival of the frogs, the better. So. By doing experimental things by, uh, for northern crabberies, we did the release of the, the one-year-olds, five-year-olds and eggs. Uh, and also just the year before last, we released uh, the, a cohort of frogs in autumn and then the cohort of frogs in spring uh, from, that, from that same cohort to see which season uh, is the best for release as well and to be me measuring that. 
And you can see there in this ESU, uh, the number of successful nests throughout there um, took a bit of a low for a period of time. Um, there was very, very little to no recruitment in this population. But more recently, the population has been increasing uh, and the number of successful nests has been increasing. And that aligned with the release of the one-year-old frogs, initially the five-year-old frogs, but also the one-year-old frogs maturing. And since then, um, we survey these guys every season. And on the final survey, we have a look in the nest to determine which male's on the nest and where, when he was released, which season he was released in, what age he was released in. We do it at the end of the season, so it doesn't disturb him attracting females to the nest, but it also gives us vital data on um, when we want to be releasing these frogs. I would show that, but I actually haven't analysed that yet. I will soon. So we've been working with the Northern Brindabella ESU for, for 10 years now. More recently though, with, this, with the bushfires, the big Duns Road, Dun, Duns Road fire that went through a lot of Kosciuszko National Park, unfortunately, uh, it also impacted quite heavily on the Northern Crobby Frog. Uh, not the Northern Brindabella area, that was untouched, but in the fiery range. So in that big patch of the distribution map um, um, there on the left-hand side, that's where most of the genetic diversity within the species lies. That's where most of the frogs within the species lies. And most of the genetic diversity. And that wasn't captured in any of the in-situ programs, ex-situ programs, sorry. None of the insurance colonies had fiery range animals. And the bushfires in January went for about 70% of those populations. Um, so that was enough of a trigger for, for us to, to apply for a grant. And fortunately, we were able to successfully got one uh, to establish an insurance colony uh, for the fiery range animals. Uh, if we're ever going to identify... Uh, genetic resistance to chytrid fungus, it's more than likely in, in crawberry frogs, it's more than likely going to be within these populations because that's where a lot of the genetic diversity lies. So we, we started establishing an insurance colony. And this is one of the breeding sites for the northern crawberry frogs. You can see the bushfires ran through your site pretty high, uh, pretty hot. All the all the tre um, all the trees around the side of the, the, the bogs got heavily burnt right throughout the bog. Uh, the sphagnum was quite crispy. Um, we went out there in uh, in March and February, March to survey these guys and mark up the nest area. And then we went back, um, we went back in, in, in um, late March to, to start collecting some eggs. We only collected a small number of eggs. Fortunately, we found a number of males calling at these sites, uh, a significant number of males calling at these sites, even post fire. It allowed us to collect a number of eggs and we collected 100 eggs to start with uh, to, to initiate the, the breeding colony. And over the next two years, we'll continue to collect some eggs from these. Now, we did find a number of northern crabby frogs at these sites. However, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens over the next number of years. So the bushfires only just had its impact. Uh, over the next couple of years now, it'll be interesting to see how that impacts the species. It, it could do a couple of things. The, the species could have just lost the numbers of frogs that died during the fire, and then it could uh, keep stable or increase. Unfortunately, other things could happen too, indirectly, um, by opening up the habitat. And, and uh, if these sites become slightly more habitable for common eastern froglets, um, then the indirect effect of chytrid as a result of that could massively impact on the crabby frog. So it'd be really interesting to see the results of the, the field survey work over the next couple of years for this species. When we went to collect the eggs, this is one of the little frogs that was actually crawling around on the surface um, uh, during the egg collection. And for those that haven't seen crabby frog eggs before, uh, these are the eggs. We only collected, uh, we collected five eggs from each of 20 nests. Only a small proportion of the eggs from each nest we collected over 20 nests to capture as much genetic diversity as possible. And you can see there within each egg, you can see the tadpole that's fully developed, ready to hatch within the egg. These guys typically hatched around two months of age. So they're quite, they're not like your, um, a lot of your, your Latorias, which hatch kind of after kind of, I don't know, three to seven days. These guys uh, are laid uh, and then within, I guess, over a couple of month period, they develop right through to a late stage tadpole ready to go. And then they sit there almost in a dormant state, ready to hatch until the autumn rains come or the, the pools flood, uh, where the eggs are laid, the eggs are actually laid in little moist terrestrial nests uh, on the edge of the pool, so not actually in the water. And then when they get some autumn rain or some early snow melt, the pools flood, and when they do, it inundates the nest, and those little eggs hatch out um, and, and um, swim off into the pool. Uh, at the zoo, all we have to do is pop these little guys into, into one of our tubs of water, uh, and they hatch over the next few days. Um, and establish their life. So we've, we've collected 100 so far and we'll continue to do that over the next couple of years. And then in four to five years time, once they start maturing, we'll be able to utilize these guys to do some trial translocations uh, back into areas where they've been heavily impacted by fire uh, or where, where the need is at the time um, to be able to bolster populations to, um, to buffer chytrid. And that's the facility as it was coming on. That was admittedly a couple of weeks ago. It looks a, a little bit more finished now. 
and just the photo from the inside that I took a couple of days ago. So um, it's occupying a little bit of my time at the moment, but we're, we're almost finished setting it up. Just the finishing touches to go, some hoods and start setting up the breeding tanks and, and this facility, which is a 40 foot, so a 12 meter long um, uh, facility for the Northern Crawberry Frogs. And we'll be able to house about 500 frogs in this facility. So um, hopefully this facility will be pumping out thousands of eggs in about maybe five to six years time for the species for, for trial translocations. And the final two species I'll, I'll talk about are two Latorias, so two tree frog species. The first one is the yellow spotted bell frog. And this is a frog that um, was thought to have been extinct in the wild for about 30 years. You can see, sorry, I'll divert back there. You can see why he gets that common name, the yellow spotted bell frog. He's got quite distinctive spots in his groin and thigh area. Uh, and there's a lot more that actually are even more distinct than, than this little guy, but it shows the, the bright, bright green spots in the, in the, in the thigh area. Um, this little frog was, was thought to have been extinct. Oh, this is the former range. Uh, it was found up in the New England Tablelands uh, up, up north. And it was also found down in the Central Tablelands and down the Southern Tablelands. And unfortunately, in the late 70s, or by 1980, it's thought that this species had disappeared. Uh, it's thought it was gone from the wild, unfortunately, uh, due to chytra fungus. And, and that's where it lied for about 29 to 30 years until one day when a uh, fisheries conservation officer, uh, Lou Pierce, was doing his surveys for a Southern pygmy perch. Uh, on a private property, um, he saw a green frog during the daytime jump into the water. And that was a sure indicator that it was a, that was a bell frog. And Luke had only seen a talk by Dave Hunter only the year before on bell frogs in the tablelands and what to keep an eye out for and so forth. And when he saw this frog, he contacted Dave Hunter. Uh, that he thinks he saw a bell frog jump in the water. He wasn't able to locate it after it jumped in because um, it bunkered down as they, as they do when they jump in the water. Um, and Dave went out there and joined Luke, and sure enough, they found it was a yellow spotted bell frog. They were expecting it to be a green and golden bell frog or something along those lines, but it was a yellow spotted bell frog. Uh, so immediately afterwards, uh, we got a phone call from Dave to, to see if we're in a position to set up an insurance colony. Uh, and of course, uh, for a species like that, I, I don't think no could be an answer. Um, so we went out there and started collecting some tadpoles. We didn't collect any adult frogs of the species because we didn't want to impact the population that was there. The species, the population was only occurring on a three to four kilometer stretch of one little, I guess, degraded rural creek on a private property, uh, just, just out of Yass. Um, so just, just above those Queanbeyan, those sites near Canberra Queanbeyan, a little bit above those, just one little stretch of creek line. And um, so we went out there and started collecting little tadpoles of these species. And you can see the one there sitting on my hand in that photo. Um, uh, to establish an insurance colony. And over, over a, uh, I guess, a three to four year period, we collected about 14 of these little guys uh, to establish the insurance colony for this species. Uh, we, set up a, we set up a facility, a container facility, similar to that for the, the crawberry frogs, um, but set it up more, I guess, designed for bell frogs to be able to, to rear large numbers of frogs as well as rear tadpoles within the facility. Um, we did that. And for the first few years, we actually had a, a, a lot of trouble breeding these guys. Um, we brought those little guys in, we reared them up over a couple of years and we had a lot of trouble breeding them. Um, and we've had a long experience with the green and golden bell frog and certainly have no problems breeding that species. Um, typically, whenever we, we pair those guys up, we're able to get eggs and, and produce them quite readily. And in fact, any species within our collection, we're able to produce um, eggs quite readily. But for this species, it took us a good four or five years of, of, of having no success whatsoever to, to be able to get any successful breeding. And and included not ever getting successful breeding within this facility you see before you here. It wasn't until we actually um, set up an outdoor aviary. Initially, we tried it all indoors, um, with artificial plants and so forth, just because we wanted to keep it as sterile as possible. To um, to with all of our with all of our conservation programs uh, within those facilities within those containers, uh, we treat qu uh, quarantine very very significantly. Uh, when we step into those facilities, our, our shoes never enter. We enter. We step into uh, gum boots. We use gloves when touching any enclosure. Before moving to the next enclosure, those gloves change. Um, it's always done first thing in the morning. And once any other animals attended to, we can't go back in those facilities. So quarantine's a, a must. We don't want to accidentally introduce any um, diseases or pathogens that these guys don't have in the wild. But eventually, when we didn't have successful breeding for four or five years straight, we figured we, we've got to bite the bullet here and, and do something a little bit more naturalistic for these guys to, to be able to get them to breed. So we built this enclosure. We made it frog proof that the mesh around it is, is I think only about the fine mesh within it. it's only about three or four mil uh, gaps so that way we stop even if even any little phallax metamorphs from trying to get into the facility because we don't want kids from getting in uh, and we built this and we, we, we created a large pool inside uh, with a shallow end the deep end gets a lot of good sunlight throughout the day 
Uh, we didn't get any successful breeding in the first year, but fortunately by the second year we did. So in 2017, um, we produced a couple of clutches of eggs from these guys. Produced a couple of clutches of eggs from these guys, and every year since, so annually now since then, we've been able we've been able to successfully produce eggs, which is really good. Uh, interestingly, with these guys, every clutch of eggs we've received from these guys so far has been unpigmented, um, including from a number of females and and um, um, and from various male combinations. Uh, the eggs are unpigmented. The little tadpoles are unpigmented too, right up until kind of maybe about seven days or so in, uh, maybe about four or five days post hatching. You can start to see a little bit of gray on them and then gradually they pigment up and become these, these nice fine tadpoles you can see in the photo in front of you there. Um, and fortunately for these guys, we've had a lot of success rearing them too. So um, been able to successfully rear kind of really high percentages through to, uh, to metamorphosis for releases, um, which has allowed us to do tra trial translocations in recent years. So in that photo there, you can see uh, the two blokes I was talking about, Dr. Dave Hunter, who once again, um, operates this program. I think you'll find with any of the frogs in southern New South Wales, uh, Dave's heavily involved. He's not leading the way with the species. He does an amazing job with frog conservation. Uh, and on the left there, you can see Luke Pierce, and he's the one who rediscovered this species. Uh, and he still surveys a lot of those populations in the area, so, so he keeps a close eye on this um, species. And you can see on the left there, some of the little metamorphs. So some of the ones produced in that first year season. Um, our initial translocations were, were to a site that was right near where the site, uh, where the frogs were rediscovered at. And I actually failed to mention, where the frogs were rediscovered at, we collected an insurance colony. And when we did, it was actually quite fortunate we did over those first few years. Because when the La Nina hit, not the La Nina we're experiencing now, but the one 10 years ago, uh, had a massive impact on this species. Unfortunately, the cold weather, um, where we barely had a day over 30 degrees Celsius down in, in, in this site, uh, is perfect for chytra fungus. That cooler wet conditions is perfect for chytra to proliferate. And as a result, unfortunately, we had higher adult mortality within that adult population, which was only about 100 frogs to start with. The other bad factor that combined in with higher adult mortality is during those years, we had massive flood events. And unfortunately, the floods happened in late December and it turned what is a chain of ponds effectively. So a series of small ponds, it turned into a two meter torrent that came down like a washing machine for these tadpoles. And, in late December, all the eggs and tadpoles are already in the stream, but they haven't metamorphosed yet. So it turned it, the, 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 the ponds into a bit of a washing machine. And unfortunately, we didn't see any metamorphs coming through. Uh, we didn't see any young ones coming through. So if any recruitment, there would have been very little. And with high adult mortality, when you're looking at a species that only lives for a few years in the wild in a kitchen environment, <clears throat> unfortunately, it didn't do well. And a couple of years later, I think by 2015, we saw our last frog at the site. So he disappeared again. So at that stage, the only ones we had left of, of this species here, the, the yellow spotteds, were actually in the insurance colony at the zoo, which made it put the pressure on a little bit more to make sure we get the breeding uh, working and down pat. Unfortunately, now it has. And the tra translocation we did at this site, we released a couple hundred frogs in um, autumn and a couple hundred frogs in spring, just to have a look at that seasonal effect. Unfortunately, at this site, because uh, that was right before the drought hit, and when the drought hit, this stream and creek totally dried up, uh, as well as a number of other streams in New South Wales uh, that had never dried before totally dried up. And as a result, uh, the frog numbers, the return rates at this site was really low. Uh, even the common frog species at this site, we, we simply couldn't find once the drought had really kicked in. Um, so uh, reintroductions were expanded to a second site as well, uh, down south. Uh, a little bit further south, we picked the suitable site. Um, and, and this site had lots of good aquatic vegetation in the water. And that seems to be a key for this species. Um, having the aquatic veg, the Pernamagetan and the milfoil in the, in the water, you, you typically, at the original site where they were rediscovered, you only find them breeding around those sites and males calling from within that. So uh, Dave picked a few good sites down there and, and Dave did the monitoring uh, down at this location. I did the monitoring up at, uh, at the location of where they were um, originally discovered um, over a couple of years. Unfortunately, at that second site, uh, the frogs are still occurring down there. Uh, last year, Dave had a number of males calling. Uh, so it's the only known site at the moment where this species exists in the wild. Uh, over the next couple of years, we're hoping that really changes. Uh, we, we've got tadpoles coming through at the zoo at the moment. We've bred them again this season and, and are rearing some young tadpoles at the moment. So we'll be doing some more trial translocations in coming years. Um, so they're, they're a very cool little frog. They're a frog that I really, really like. Um, so we wanted to learn a little bit more about these frogs. So we, we put transmitters on 20 of them. And uh, I stayed down at the farm kind of a little bit east of Canberra for, for a couple of weeks uh, radio tracking these guys. And, found out that I'm not the only one who likes these frogs. Um, 
Red Belly Black Snakes really like them too, unfortunately. <laughs> we had a we had a few of the frogs uh, succumb to predation, but through radio tracking them and following them throughout the, the creek system, we're able to learn a little bit more about the species and what they do post-release. Um, we're hoping to really expand on that in the coming years. So, so watch this space. Um, I'm hopeful over the next coming years, if we produce thousands of frogs for release of a number of sites, we're really going to have some populations kick in and establish uh, and hopefully start to build numbers of these species again in the wild. And then finally, I hope I'm not going too far out of time, no? Uh, there's one more species that I'll talk a little bit briefly about. It's called the Buralong frog. Um, and the Buralong frog is, is a small frog species. They're, they're, a, they're a hylid. Um, they're theoretically a tree frog, although you won't find these guys in trees. These guys are found along rocky creek lines and rocky streams. And you often find them along areas, along creek lines where there's bedrock or there's cobblestones. Uh, they really occupy that kind of rocky environment. And this frog species is found predominantly on the western, western flowing streams of the Great Dividing Range. It's found from northern New South Wales, the New England Tablelands, uh, where Jody Rally's team rediscovered a population only a couple of years ago, right down to Victoria. And they're only found kind of a, a stone's throw over the border into Victoria. Uh, so they're predominantly within New South Wales, but they get just over the Victorian border as well. And this species is listed on the IUCN as critically endangered. Uh, they are a species that's disappeared from a good part of, portion of their range in recent years, certainly well over 50%, if not a lot, a lot more. Um, it's a species we worked with for some time. Uh, at Taronga, we initially worked with this species back in 2007. Uh, so during the, during the, towards the end of the millennial drought, when a lot of the, the creek lines around southwestern New South Wales were starting to dry up, um, this species is quite short lived. They only live for a few years. Uh, and some of these creek lines were starting to dry up, and having no recruitment for a couple of years can cause local extinctions. So uh, once again, Dave Hunter, uh, working on this species, gave us the call to, to take some in and see if we can establish an insurance colony and establish breeding techniques. And, and fortunately for this species, we were able to quite rapidly. Um, I think we collected 33 frogs back then in, in initial collection. And uh, within the first breeding season, we had representation. So we bred from almost all of those frogs. We were able to produce large numbers of frogs. Um, they were quite successful. We had frogs laying eggs around the cobblestones. You can see there, um, <coughs> pardon me. There's a half pipe that's been overturned. Uh, they lay their eggs uh, under half pipes uh, amongst the rocks. Uh, that nice little kind of tight gelatinous egg mass. And this is typical of a species found in a, in a flowing stream environment. So the eggs are quite tight together so they don't get washed away in the stream environment. Uh, we're able to produce frogs. We, we, we did some trial reintroductions to see if we can establish a technique to get them to work. Uh, we did a few other things with the species too. Uh, that bottom left photo you can see, we, we did some trials with um, immunity to chytrid fungus. So we, we looked at um, whether or not they can develop immunity to chytrid fungus. We looked at whether they can acquire immunity to chytrid fungus. Uh, that was work done with uh, the Lee Skerritt and the Lee Berger lab uh, with Scott Cashins and Laura Grogan. Um, and then on the right there, you can see Dave again with, with a group of students. Uh, we did some community education campaigns where uh, Taronga Zoo, um, National Parks, OEH, or DPIE now, uh, and the local land services did a educational campaigns with, with the local schools in the area and brought them out to the sites, brought them up to the zoo for a sleepover. I went down there and did some campaigns to really try to raise the profile of the species in those environments. And we did that for a few years. But then when the La Nina kicked in, for this species, it was kind of almost a benefit. Um, what that did, all the heavy rainfall actually flushed a lot of the sediment and silt out of the streams uh, where they occur. And for this species, some of the threats are chytrid fungus, but a lot of the other threats are, for this species include things like willows, whose whose uh, root masses kind of fill the gaps in the rocks. And this is a species that lays its eggs between gaps in the rock, so between the cobblestones, between gaps in the bedrock. Um, sedimentation, so not having that riparian vegetation, the sediment still washes into the stream and it fills the gaps in the rocks in the stream. And although it may look like the stream's okay, any sediment in the stream takes out breeding habitat. And what the La Nina did with the big floods, it flushed out a lot of that sediment, opened up some habitat, and then this species was able to kind of recolonize in a lot of those areas. And that's the ideal scenario for us. Even though we're breeding the species for release to the wild, if they're able to do it themselves and we don't need to do it, that's awesome. And that's our preferred scenario. Um, so they're able to establish themselves uh, and the populations uh, seem quite healthy again after that. So we didn't continue to work with the species uh, down in that southwestern portion of their range. However, in the last year, um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the severe drought we had uh, right up until the end of last year. Uh, it's one of the severest droughts we've ever had in New South Wales, um, extremely severe drought. And what that did was dry up a lot of the rivers and the creeks up in northern New South Wales. Areas, um, areas up in the, 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 northern, the northern portion of the range of the Burralong Frog, up around the Tamworth region, 
um, that northern tablelands region in New South Wales. And, and there's a consultant up there, environmental consultant, uh, Phil Spark, who, who does an amazing job. He, he does a lot of the survey work for amphibians and reptiles, various turtle species and lizard species uh, up, in, up in that northern part of the state. Uh, he raised the alarm that, that this species was going to be in a lot of trouble. He, he'd done monitoring for a number of years at sites for the, for the Burralong frog uh, in the northern populations of the range um, and, and had established where various populations are and, and so forth. And he went out there doing his surveys and he wasn't finding any frogs. And in some sites, he was finding that the stream had totally dried in some areas where there was hundreds of frogs previously, uh, there was nothing. He couldn't find a single frog. And he raised the alarm and, and pretty soon, within, I guess, a month of raising that alarm, that he, he could only find, I think, 36 frogs, I think it was, he tallied up that across the sites he surveyed, um, which was quite worrisome. And at the time, the time, there was no sign of the drought breaking either. We we're really worried that the northern Burralong frog, who's, who may be quite distinct from the southern and central Burralong frogs, was going to disappear over the summer period. Um, so it was a great thing he raised that alarm. He raised it with uh, Dr. Dave Hunter and Dave Coote from uh, DPIE as well. Um, uh, who, who, who Dave Coote also does an amazing job of threatened frogs in New South Wales. Uh, and, and soon enough, within a month, we're able to, or certainly within less than a month, we're able to get up there and, and undertake a salvage effort to try to uh, find any remaining individuals of the species. And, you can see some of these, some of these are actually, some of these creeks and rivers you see in these photos have actually never run dry and, and they were almost totally dry. So, in, or for the most part, they were totally dry. Uh, so in late December, uh, just prior to, about four days prior to Christmas, in fact, uh, the permits had come through, we're right and ready to go. And we went up there and there's a whole team from, from Taronga, from DPIE, from the Australian Museum, uh, and included, um, led by Phil Spark, who was, who was coordinating which sites to, to survey and where to find the frogs. And we covered lots of creeks and rivers and streams and, and really looking for the deepest holes in those creeks and rivers because anywhere where it wasn't the deepest hole, simply you wouldn't find any water. It was just bone dry, that the soil was crispy and, uh, and powder dry. And we went to areas, spoke to a lot of local landholders around those areas to ask them where they think the deepest hole uh, in the creeks or rivers might be. And, and sure enough, we went to those sites to look for burlong frogs. And, and this is typically what we found. This is the this is pretty much the deepest hole. And you can see here that you can't even see the, the top of the creek line there. It's, this is quite a, this would be at least a couple of meters higher, this typically this river. And it's down to this small little portion. I don't know if you can look closely in that little stagnant bit of water there, but there's probably at least 12 turtles in there. Uh, you can see the backs of them uh, in the photo there. There's quite a few of them, uh, poor little things, um, that can condense down to those last little drying water holes. And around the, each of these little ponds, every now and then, most of them, there's no Burralong frogs whatsoever. Uh, we may find a couple of a couple of ladder pomata or a parent tree frog, uh, but some of them we'd find one, sometimes occasionally two Burralongs. And we were successful over those, uh, over those, um, those days of collection. Uh, and finding some of them, fortunately, we're able to find 60 of them. Um, 60 Burralong frogs, uh, fortunately, and, and we actually found some more that we left because there was, there was some sites where, there was one site where we collected up to 10 of them and we didn't want to collect any more from around a certain area. So we, we left the rest of them and that site was potentially going to be a, one that remains. And we brought 60 back to Taronga Zoo. Um, um, soon after arrival back at the zoo, uh, two had died within the first 24 hours and, and upon post-mortem, um, they had really heavy, uh, heavy loads of a brain parasite, a mix of brain, brain parasite that had, had really had a massive impact on their brain, which would have, which would have killed them. One little bit of extra stress on top of um, what they were experiencing with the parasite was enough to top them over. Fortunately though, since December last year, since that initial collection, the other 58, we haven't had a single frog die uh, in almost 12 months now. So for a frog that only lives for a few years, I would have expected a lot more uh, just natural attrition. We collected, most of the frogs we collected were adults because they simply weren't breeding in that, in that, in that river. There was no breeding in that last year. And the year before, there would have been minimal breeding because of, because of the drought period. So fortunately, um, we've done really well with these guys to date. Um, 58 of them are still alive and, and some are set up for breeding at, at the moment. Uh, so fortunately, uh, well, we're, we're, setting, we're starting to set up a facility for these frogs, uh, another container facility. Uh, we'll be having containers everywhere pretty soon. Um, and hopefully we'll see what the survey results from this year indicate. Uh, now there's a little bit of water in the system. Hopefully it, uh, these frogs are able to establish and, and come out of cracks from somewhere that we, we're not sure where, um, where they may have been hiding, come out of cracks and breed. But it does appear that a number of the local populations have, would, would likely be extinct at these sites and, and, and require reintroduction back to the wild. And, so for next, next season, once the survey results come back in this year, we'll find out what happens. And then next year, we'll work out where we need to breed and release and, and start a, a reintroduction program for this species throughout some of their range where they, 
would have disappeared through that due to that really extreme drought. I think that might be about the last of it, guys. That takes me to the 8.30 mark, which was the that opening. That's pretty perfect timing, I'd say. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Do you want to, I, I don't, you, you can stay host if you like, but, um, but if you stop sharing your screen, we'll see some faces, um, sure. which might be quite nice. It'd be almost like, like we're in the pub again. Um, my, my apologies if there was anyone in the waiting room for, for, for too long uh, while I was talking. I was trying to accept them all as they, as they popped up. <laughs> we've, had a, we've had a hot tip from Marina as well that said um, that apparently there's a co-host option. So we'll look into that for next time and, um, and awesome. we'll see that, how we go. So thanks, Marina. Um, now is a good time for you to ask your questions. If you just want to type your question, you can type it straight into the chat box. If you'd like to ask your question in person, just type Q or question into the box. And then as we read them, we'll come to you and we'll, you can put your video on, you can put your microphone on and it'd be like a real human interaction, which I think would be pretty awesome. Um, while you're thinking about that, while you're typing your questions or, or just typing a Q to, for us to ask you, I might just take a moment to tell you that our December speaker is going to be Dr. Jodie Rowley, who, um, who Michael just mentioned um, of Virulong Frog fame. Um, Judy Rowley is from the Australian Museum and she'll be talking on the 3rd of December. So keep your eyes open for the registration link. It'll be through Zoom again, just like this. Um, and you can find the link through our website, frogsvic.org, um, through Facebook, through Instagram or Twitter. If you want to be one of the first to know, if you sign up to our, our uh, there's a green box on our website that says Frog Curious. If you sign up to our updates through there, you'll be the first to know when we, when we release the details of Jodie's talk. Um, and talks for next year as well, when, as and when they come about. If you think Jodie's name is familiar, that's probably because you know her, because she's famous for being an amazing frog person, for one thing, but also she is um, one of the key members of the team of the Frog ID Project. Um, frog ID is a citizen science program, um, and I thought I might mention it that tonight is Frog ID Week Eve, so tomorrow begins the absolute blitz of uh, frog ID. If you're not familiar with it, let me show you this here now. This is the app. Um, and you can just download it on your phone if you just type in frog ID and you can just record frog calls through that app. It will send them to verify by experts. You'll be able to tell what frogs you've got calling um, and that will all go into the big database that's used by all sorts of scientists for all sorts of science. So their big week starts tomorrow night or tomorrow um, and goes on for a whole week. So if you're going to join in at any time, this coming week is the perfect time to do so. In the meantime, though, that's Jody Rowley next December. In the meantime, though, we have Michael with us. So let's see what we've got for some of our questions. I should also say, Michael, thank you so much for being our guinea pig. If you, if you just joined us, um, this is Frogs Victoria's first Zoom meeting. And none of us are technologically gifted at all. So, um, so if you're able to hear us, we're doing well. <laughs> so anyway, let's see what we've got here. Um, Colin McHenry, Mike, that was awesome. Best Zoom of 2020 and also a queue. Colin, would you like to take your question? Give us your question. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, Mike, great talk. Thank you so much for that. Really inspiring actually. Um, just in the threatened species world, we hear so many um, negative stories, I guess. And what you, what you really brought to us today was um, maybe some problems, but also some solutions. And I, I just, I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, I guess my question for you is, um, when we were, you know, when I was learning about conservation biology, we, we talked about, and, and you referred to this a little bit, um, about in situ and ex situ techniques. You know, and it was like you either do one or the other. But I think what perhaps um, what recent history is showing you, showing us is that, um, you know, if we're going to navigate the coming years, we have to very smartly hold both in our hands and, and go and use both ex situ and in situ techniques um, together and almost actively manage how we're, dealing with these populations, you know, as weather conditions change, you know, as we go through El, La Nina, we go through um, El Nino. And um, I mean, you're right at the, the, the front of this. Is that, is that the discussion that's happening amongst the people who are planning these recovery operations? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, that's one of those things, I guess, 
in situ, if we're able to conserve a species in situ, um, that's by far the preferred scenario and, and, and the, the technique to go. But unfortunately for some of these species, that I guess they're right at the brink and the things like the crabby frog and the, the yellow spotted bell frog or some of the other species we work with uh, within my department, the Bellinger river turtle and two of the lizards from Christmas Island that are extinct in the wild now, um, by setting up insurance colonies, it kind of buys a bit of time to be able to work out the in situ component. So, so if, a, if, if it can be done in situ without the need for ex situ, that, that's awesome and amazing. Um, but unfortunately, we're in a position where a number of these species really do need the, the ex situ to, to be able to assure, their, assure them in the long term. And once again, I, I still believe it's a, a short term scenario. Hopefully, we don't have to hold them forever. That's not, not the aim. It's to kind of be able to hold them in the short term. But the benefit of having colonies at Taronga Zoo, for example, or Melbourne Zoo, uh, or some of the other uh, zoos is, is that we're able to produce animals too that can be utilised for research. Uh, so it can be utilised to try to identify immunity to chytrid or any of those kind of things where you wouldn't want to impact on the wild population. So, so it very, very, it very much is a link. Uh, it's one of those things that ex situ conservation can't be done without a link to in situ. And uh, through these programs, we've got some amazing partners, um, like within DPIE, within National Parks and Wildlife, uh, Zoos Victoria, um, and, and the other zoos that we work with, there's, there's a whole range, and universities, of course, University of Wollongong, but Phil Byrne and his lab down there, or uh, Lisa Garrett Lee Berger in their lab uh, doing work at the University of Melbourne. And, Benny Shield at, at ANU. There's a lot of collaborators on these on these jobs, and I guess for, for the programs that, that I highlighted there today as well, on each of those collaborations, it's it's a really positive collaboration, and, and there's no kind of uh, competitive nature. There's no arguing. There's not none of that. Everyone's kind of trying to do the best for the species. So, and in doing so, um, I guess we're, we're achieving some good outcomes. Am I allowed a follow up question, Lynette? Since it's you, Colin, this is Colin McHenry, Frog Victoria Secretary, everybody, so he gets special treatment. Frog oh, oh, I feel ashamed. Um, I guess maybe the last year has, well, just personally shown me that things can change a lot quicker than we had imagined. Yeah. And, and maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not alone in that. Um, yeah, definitely. And so... I mean, obviously, things like crawberries and, you know, um, spotted tree frogs, they were always on our watch list, right? But, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, are there, are there species who we feel like, uh, yeah, look, we know they're threatened, but maybe they're okay, that now we should be paying a lot more attention to? Because if things keep changing very quickly, then we may need to be intervening much more heavily with that combination of in situ and ex situ that you've talked about so well today. Yeah, de definitely, Colin. I think monitoring is key. Be being able to, for some of those threatened species that aren't right at the edge that may not be getting closely monitored, as you said, it's one of those things that declines could happen without you realising. Monitoring, getting that good monitoring data on those species, it really is key to be able to identify when the, the species needs intervention, where, when it needs ex situ. So, um, no, I, t I totally agree. It's, it's a very good point. And there are a few species like that. And with things like the drought and the bushfires, things can change so rapidly. Thanks, Mike. That's, yeah, that's great. Thanks. All right. That's enough out of you, Colin. Um, so if anybody else has any questions, do feel free to um, type your questions straight into the chat box there and we can read it out. Or if you want to ask it yourself, you can just type a Q in and we'll come to you. Um, I've got a question for you, Michael. The crawberry <laughs> frogs that are maturing at like four or five years old, um, yeah. How long would you expect them to live in captivity? Like forever? <laughs> they do live for quite some time. So in the wild, like Dave's done skeleto chronology work that shows they live for about nine years in the wild. Whereas at the zoo, we've got frogs kind of approaching the 20 year mark. We still got a number of uh, Northern Crabby frogs uh, that were collected as eggs in 2003 to 2005 that, that are still breeding each year. and and they don't seem to be really increasing like their mortality rate kind of thing that there's very little mortality in that group and they're still breeding each year quite readily. So I suspect it's one of those things that in, in a captive setting, some of those for, uh, reptiles and amphibians that, that are short lived in the wild, things like, I guess, some of the rock dragons that might live for a year or so in, in a zoo setting or a, a captive setting, they can live for 10 years or so. So I suspect some of these crawberry frogs may live for 25 years plus. Um, how long they live before I stop breeding them, I'm not sure. Uh, right. They certainly live for quite some time. I, I can see one question there, Lynn. How, how do you track individual frogs? I was about to ask you that one from Andre. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Uh, so for the crappy frogs, and that was the one I was mentioning, we released different cohorts of them. Uh, for crappy frogs, we actually identified them from their pattern marking. So that pattern on their back, you can see that stripe pattern, it's quite distinctive. But when you flip a crappy frog over, they've got a series of blotches on their belly, and that's even more distinctive. So typically we take uh, photographs of the back and belly of each animal that's released. And then when we go out there and do the surveys, and the surveys, oh, I, I don't know the level of experience, I guess, of the people tuning in, but for the surveys for, for this genus or these frogs anyway, it's a little bit different. When we go out there to survey the northern crabberies or the southern crabberies, we, we yell at the frogs. Uh, we shout at them, um, which would cause most frogs to kind of clam up and, and stay quiet. But crabby frogs, they think you're another male and they give off their territorial call back at you and they call back pretty, pretty, um, pretty readily. So that's how we survey for them when we're surveying. And of course, when we survey initially, we just mark the nest and we don't disturb the male. Um, but, but then when we come back at the end of the breeding season, um, so if, as I mentioned for those northern crabberies uh, in the northern brindies, I check the nest right at the end of the breeding season, uh, once the females have laid their eggs, but before the males left, just to get an idea of his pattern, take photographs of him, and then I can work out whether or not he was released as a one-year-old or as a five-year-old. So really it's the, the pattern marking on those frogs that determine, uh, helps us to, to track the cohorts. Excellent. Now, I think you probably could see this coming, but uh, can you show us how you shouted a frog, please, Michael? I can do. Um, so we have Norvins. Norvins tends to be a little bit softer uh, when we're yelling at those guys, but the Southerns, it's more of a, um, yeah, frog! I don't know if I wake my neighbours up there, but, but uh, yeah, we give them a good shout. So Dave Hunter, Dave Hunter is extremely loud. He's loud at the best of times. Uh, <laughs> when he yells it out, uh, the frogs respond pretty, pretty readily, and he's been doing it for many, many years. In fact, I think one of his master's chapters was looking at the, the response rate of the frogs to, to, um, to the shout response technique. But yeah, we put a good yell. You can you really yell anything and the things will call back at you. Uh, even things like red crown toilets, which are more local to where I am at the zoo. And you, you make a, a, a little squeak noise or any kind of noise and they start calling back at you. That's amazing. Fantastic. We've got a question from Marie Callins. Um, Michael, how do you set up a disease-free outdoor enclosure, especially with plants that are chytrid fungus free? Sure. So for the, for the big enclosures that you saw there, uh, down in Kosciuszko, they were actually created at sites that used to be, um, they were impacted by like snowy hydro sites. So there was no existing bogs, there was no uh, wet areas within those sites. It was kind of a, I guess, a, a big big area of rubble kind of thing. So there's no existing frogs at those sites. So the chance of chytrid being in there is pretty slim. There's always a risk that a frog's been in there or so forth, but, but they're, they're pretty... Uh, I, I guess not suitable for frog sites and and actually both of them are in areas where there was one of them was in an area where there was no frogs so there's no suitable frog habitat the good thing about working up there in Kosciuszko there's only a few frog species that occur up there so you've got the common eastern froglet you've got the alpine tree frog and, and the southern crabby frog uh, the alpine tree frogs disappeared from a lot of that area um, due to chytrid and so you still have the common eastern froglet and the southern crabby frog and, and some of those sites that aren't suitable habitat for those species um, there's no frogs there at all. So one of the disease-free enclosure sites is at a site that there's no frogs existing at. The other one, the ha where it was set, it wasn't really suitable for frogs. It was like rubble. So um, the fence was put up at those sites to exclude frogs. And then they did all the work inside the enclosure, built the ponds, built everything else. Uh, in terms of not bringing it into the enclosure afterwards with plants and, and that kind of thing, uh, if you're bringing in aquatic plants, I think you're a high risk of, you run a high risk of bringing in chytrid fungus. Uh, however, for some of the plants that, that, that exist that, have been brought in from areas like nurseries and that kind of thing where there's no frogs and the chance of bringing in chytrid is fairly slim. Uh, unless frogs have been, uh, been wet and crawling over the, the plants and so forth right before they go into the enclosure, uh, the chance of bringing in spores from, um, I guess, in tussocks and that kind of thing uh, is, is pretty slim. Uh, if you're bringing in an aquatic plant that's from a kind of an aquatic environment or rocks from an aquatic environment or something like that, I think you run a high risk of bringing in chytrid, but, but um. Fortunately, at those enclosures, we haven't had chytrid in any of the enclosures so far. So due to the precautions taken, like at the site, putting up the fence and then bringing in plants we think are low risk, um, we've been quite fortunate that chytrid hasn't got into those um, into those sites. Yeah, right. Um, thank you for that. Stephanie Vestegan, who's one of our committee members, she has a question for you. Steph, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Um, I've Steph. been... I watched uh, your Instagram story the other day of the uh, shipping containers getting slowly um, dropped into Taronga. I've done that before and I know how nerve wracking it is. So <laughs> um, good to see that it's coming along well. Um, I just wanted to ask 
Is there any plans um, or talks for any other in situ enclosures for like other species, obviously other than the crabby frog? I'm just curious to see like, ha has there been talk with like something like the yellow spotted frog or is it a lot harder to, then you have to put a roof on it and you're getting that price up? Because I know the whole point of the in situ enclosures is just they're so much cheaper than having them in a shipping container thousand kilometers away so um yeah definitely no no definitely um we have we have discussed it we discussed it for the bell frogs we discussed it for other things too so for things like stream burning frogs just say like a spotted tree frog for example um things like flood events and that kind of thing i, I don't think an enclosure would probably stand up to those kind of natural occurrences too well uh, for the yellow spotted bell frog, we, we considered actually doing that, uh, especially when we had a few years there where we couldn't get the things breeding and we we're kind of desperate to get them breeding. We we're looking at setting up a uh, disease free enclosure in the wild. But as you said, having to have a roof on it, um, effectively it'd be like a large aviary. Um, and that's something that, that sorry, a couple of people to admit back in. Um, that, um, we consider that, but looking at the options and, and the, the issues with enclosing the site and having it large enough to sustain a large number of the frogs long term um, we ended up steering away from it thinking that it could be used like we used the aviary at the zoo for example um, but as a long-term strategy we kind of erred, erred away from it cool thank you thanks Steph. thanks michael marnie fitzsimmons wants to know how are the tracking devices attached do they come off on their own or do you have to capture them again I would say a bit of both. Unfortunately, some of the latter, some of the former, uh, some came off on their own, which wasn't good for my data set. Um, but but, but uh, for the most part, uh, it, it was capturing them to take them off again. So towards the end, um, after a number of, or a good number of weeks, um, the remaining frogs are caught and cut the transmitter off to, to, to let go. Uh, some of the frogs were able to, to get free of their little tracking belt, uh, which, didn't please me, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we, we have to catch them and take them off again. And what are the, what are the tracking belts made of? Uh, it's a, it's a surgical silicone uh, tube. Okay. Uh, inside there's a, there's, I guess, nylon thread uh, that, that's, that, that holds it together, um, but it's a silicon, surgical silicon tube. So that way it prevents kind of any kind of rubbing on the frog and it, it doesn't impact on the side of the frog. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. Um, Sharon Reed wants to know, um, and before I, before I ask you this question, I'll just say, Sharon, um, we just released a, a position statement on feral horses in the Alps, and it's on our website. If you go to frogsvic.org, um, you'll find it on one of the many drop downs there to have a read if you want to, um, want to know the Frogs Victoria position on that. Um, but Michael, if you'd like to comment on, do you, uh, do you have any, do you do any direct experience with, with horses in the Alps? Um, yeah, a little bit. So my experience with, with them isn't isn't great in terms of um, uh, the sites I've been to. In southern crabby frogs, there's certainly there's certainly some horse damage. I got photos of one little bog that had a little bit of a, a surveyor's tape around where the frog was calling from, where it was tied earlier in the season, and then the, the rest of that little pool, only a small pool, maybe two meters by a meter, uh, and so I came back at the end of the season. It was just a, a mess of mud of horse uh, prints all around, but. But a lot of where the southern crabby frogs are existing at the moment, the horse numbers are fairly low. Uh, where the northern crabby frogs are, it's it's a bit it's a bit higher around for northern crabby frogs than it is for southerns. Uh, and the sites where they're most impacting, uh, they're not sites that I frequent, so not the northern Brindy. So uh, Dave Hunter and Ben Shear would have a lot more experience with them at those sites than than myself. Um, but but I've certainly seen horses up there in Kosciuszko, and and have seen some horse damage at some of the sites that the southern crabby frogs existed at. Yeah. So they're, they're, not, they're not good. They need to go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I um, uh, just well, I was going to follow up on that. Oh, Sharon, I know that's what I was going to follow up on. Sharon, I saw your message earlier about Zoom being much easier for you to um, to watch from out in the regions. Um, if we do go back in the pub, we've invested in some new kit, a microphone um, and the like. So if we do end up back in the pub doing this back online, We'd be recording the videos, but they'll be in much higher quality than they were before. So rest assured, if we if we leave Zoom again, um, you'll be you'll have you'll have a better quality product to watch nonetheless. So so glad to hear that you're joining us from the regions. Thank you for that. All right, Nick Kleeman, um, do you want to ask a question in person, Nick? <laughs> Nick is our vice president and general troublemaker. 
Um, Mac, I want to thank you, mate. Um, it was a fantastic presentation. And um, and just a statement there. I mean, um, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable what Dave Hunter's doing and has done, you know, two decades there. And um, it's, it's a bit scary to imagine what frogs um, in southern New South Wales would look like without Dave's influence. But, of course, Dave can't do it without having um, the sort of captive support he gets from you guys and from Dan and Gilbert and co at, um, at Zoos Victoria. So uh, um, my my typed question was um, silly, of course, um, but I want to, just want to thank you, mate. It's really good to see you. And I, I hope we can do that in person before too long. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think his chances are pretty good, Nick. Uh, I think he's won the absentee ballots counted so far, and uh, I may have just Google that uh, after I see your question pop up, <laughs> so I can give a, a reasonable answer. Yeah. <laughs> Played the politics with your frogs, you get everything in front of you. <laughs> All right, one last question to Meredith Graham. I found a dead frog in my yard. Can I tell if it had chytrid by just looking at it? Un unfortunately not. Like a, a frog that's died from chytrid, um, the way they look sometimes, it, it could have died from because sometimes you'll see kind of reddening or lesions. Sometimes you'll see excess skin sloughing on the frog. Um, a frog that looks like that could have died from a number of things. Uh, so the way we test from um, Meredith is by swabbing them. Uh, so the typical test is by using a swab, um, a sterile swab over the skin uh, and analyzing that through PCR uh, to determine if there's um, DNA of chytrid fungus on the skin of the frog. And that's how we are able to analyze it. And there's, there's labs like... Um, the one I sent them to Caesar down in down in Melbourne uh, to analyse for for chytrid fungus, but yeah, but just by looking at the frog, unfortunately, it's you can't tell for certain whether it was chytrid or whether it was a number of other kind of either fungal pathogens or or even systemic kind of um, illnesses that caused it. Yeah. Okie dokie. Well, um, all that's left to say is thank you very very much, Michael McFadden, for your fantastic talk and for all the great work you do for frogs. And, um, and I think it's fair to say that everybody has really enjoyed listening to you tonight. And thank you to everyone that's, enjoy it, that's joined us from wherever you are in the world, um, be it just around the corner in Melbourne or all the way on the other side of the planet. Thank you so much for being in the audience. Thank you, Michael, for talking to us. And we'll see you all again in December. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. I've asked the, the committee to stay on so that um, we can have a quick chat, Michael. That's uh, we'll just wait for him to disappear. Nice to see you, David Newell. See you. And then there was us. Oh no, there's 14 people left still. Can you also Joe raise hands for questions? I couldn't find. Oh, I couldn't. If you can still hear me, Rowena, I couldn't find the button to do it. Um, but I will look into it in the settings in the back end of it for next time. Thank you so much for your help on the participants list. I thought that's where I looked for it. I'll look into it. Thank you so much. <laughs> See you next time. Still got 10 people here still hanging on. <laughs> I'll turn the videos off. Um, so what I would like to do, let me stop recording.